Hey, everybody, and welcome back to NatChat, where, as you know, or if this is your first episode, are now finding out, we are exploring what to do as a college student or recent graduate who is not so excited or feels let down by a somewhat broken education system and this world of one-size-fits-all careers. In this episode, I am joined by Zach Slayback. Zach is one of the few people in this industry who puts his money where his mouth is. He actually dropped out of the University of Pennsylvania, where he was studying philosophy when he realized that college just wasn't for him. Since then, he worked on business development with a startup that was actually helping put college students in apprenticeship roles. And he's published his own book, The End of School, as well as become the lead of publishing for an online publication called The Mission at Medium. Zach's a really smart guy, and he's thought very deeply about a lot of these issues. And he's had experience going outside the school system, learning on your own, developing that reputation and that skill set, and actually getting to work with some really respected people in his field. He's been invited to schools and companies around the country to speak on a number of these topics, and we had a really wide-ranging conversation from some of the problems of nonprofits in the beginning to his dissatisfaction with the school system, how kids can go after apprenticeships, and what an amazing way that is to learn, and then just into some of our own experiences with learning skills on your own, getting these initial opportunities, reaching out. It was fairly broad, but in the best way and that it will be useful to you if you're in any step of the process. So with that, let's bring Zach on the show and be sure to check out all of his stuff at zachslayback.com afterwards. Hey, Nat, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. So you were speaking at a conference, right? Yeah. So I uh, just spoke this morning at something called the State Policy Network. So there is a massive like libertarian conspiracy to take over the world and leave everybody alone. And there, every state has what's called a, well, a think tank in the State Policy Network. And they all get together once a year somewhere and hold a big, big junket. And that's what I'm at right now. So they invited me to speak this morning and essentially tell them why I think they're wrong. So it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think they're wrong about? Uh, I think that they're wrong about a couple of things. Uh, one, there's a big focus in this world specifically on what's called movement building about like getting the right donors and the right organizations doing the right things, right? Which is actually like really ironic when you think about it, because uh, a lot of the arguments against government intervention are that like, you don't know where resources should be allocated. You don't have that information. That's why markets exist. And you need to like be humble about that. And then they're like very, very arrogant about oh, this organization needs to be doing this. This one needs to be doing this. This one needs to be doing this. And what ends up what you end up getting is a lot of infighting over scarce resources. And you get what is a self-sustaining objective of sustaining the movement when in reality you should have a goal that you're trying to achieve and if you achieve that goal then great you should all be unemployed <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i i don't like nonprofits there's literally only one nonprofit that i can think of that achieved its goal and dissolved itself and that's 911 victims memorial fund so there's that point and then there's also like the people who tend to be attracted to this specific subset of philosophies tend to be very rationalistic they tend to think in terms of, I just need to present a good argument for people and they should listen to my argument. And if they don't listen to my argument, then it's their fault. And they'll change their behavior responding to pure logic, right? Right, right. And it's like, no, it turns out, first of all, they're probably not going to listen to you, period. And secondly, there are a lot of facts out there and people make, like, I was tweeting about this earlier. I'm not sure if you saw it. Are you familiar with like the big five personality index? Yeah, exactly. Openness, neuroticism, three others. Yeah. So political beliefs are actually highly correlated against openness and conscientiousness. Conservatives tend to be highly conscientious and liberals tend to be highly open, right? So if you're making an argument based on conscientiousness to liberals, it's not going to work. If you're making an argument based on openness to conservatives, it's not going to work. So they're also wrong about that. <laughs> so when I say I don't like nonprofits, that I like them. I like what they're doing, but they need to be more focused. <laughs> what do you specifically think is the issue with nonprofits? Because I've heard arguments like this before. I'm curious what yours are. There's two things. One, I think, is the incentive structure, right? Like going back to that question of what are you actually trying to achieve? A lot of nonprofits actually don't know. So I work a lot in the education space and education nonprofits are some of the worst. And education for profits are actually very bad at this too. Education is one of these things where you get a lot of really warm and fuzzies when things work right. It's like, oh, we're helping children learn. Yay. But like you have to track something and what are you actually tracking on the learning and how are you tracking learning? Are you just tracking like you got a teacher to click a tweet a thousand times? How does that actually translate into learning, right? 
law nonprofits are not very good at that. I like single issue nonprofits for that reason is that they're much better at actually tracking these things because they have a very clear goal of like what they want to achieve, right? The second is there's not nearly as much skin in the game. If you fuck up as a nonprofit, like, eh, you might lose a couple donors, but honestly, you probably aren't. And you're not going to see an immediate feedback on that, too. Whereas, like, as a for-profit company, you actually will see very quick market feedback that tells you, like, you messed up, you need to be doing something different. So there's incentive questions there. There's the broader incentive question of, like, why don't more nonprofits shut down? If a nonprofit is effective, we should see more shutting down. And we don't. Like I said, I've, I've only really ever seen one. So it's a skin in the game issue. It's a focus issue. It's a results oriented issue. There's some nonprofits are better than others. Like the rationalist community has a website. I forget the name of it. There's, there's a number of websites that like effective altruism, like the effective altruists are very good at tracking this, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Well, I was listening to Joe Rogan was interviewing the, I can't remember his name now, but it's like the former CEO of Quest Nutrition. And he was saying something similar that when they started, I guess they had considered briefly doing a nonprofit because their real goal was to improve nutrition, like help people be healthy and save people's lives. And then they eventually realized that they would just be way more effective as a for-profit company focused on creating better alternatives to these things people wanted to eat, right? So instead of eating a candy bar, you eat the like Quest Nutrition bar. And his argument sounded very similar that if you actually want to change behaviors and change part of the marketplace, you kind of have to be in the marketplace and be incentivized to do it well. And especially what you were saying around tracking and metrics and like actually understanding the business side of it, that tends to feed so much back into the growth and it's easy to ignore it if you're not focused on profits, I imagine. Oh yeah. And like going back to the temperaments question, you know, I have seen this company is not a great example anymore, unfortunately, because they've totally shot themselves in the feet multiple times over PR wise. But Uber is a very good example of actually changing policy without having to argue with people, right? You can talk to someone who very much believes in government enforced monopolies, uh, so like taxi cartels, but if they actually use a service that goes against that multiple times and they really like that service, they're going to actually end up putting pressure on politicians. So there's this quotation. I used to give a talk on social change. And I would give it to young Republican clubs, young Democrat clubs, like political clubs on college campuses. And I would pull out this quotation from somebody, and this guy essentially says, it's not the job of city bureaucrats to get in the way of innovation. And I'd have people guess, you know, like who said that? And like some people say like Milton Friedman, Ron Paul, like all these free market people. It's Bill Peduto, who is the, you know, like blue collar Democrat mayor of Pittsburgh. And that's because the incentives are just set up in such a way. You actually give people better options. They're going to change their behavior without you having to actually change their explicitly stated political beliefs. Right. How are you getting invited to give these talks? What was it coming from? Uh, so I was very fortunate when I was working at Praxis to be able to give talks quite often because that was actually part of our marketing plan is like we'd go, we'd give a talk and usually like five or six students would come up and talk to us afterwards. And like those five or six, one or two might actually be really good candidates for the program. So that was quite fortunate. And I was able to do that for one or two years. And I just created a lot of momentum and built up a reputation as somebody who can go and give talks on interesting topics. So since then, I've just you know kind of changed the topics here and there related to whatever the specific club or organization wants me to be talking about, right? So I, a lot of stuff on education, a lot of stuff on social change, stuff on like professional development as well. So those are like the three buckets a lot of my stuff gets put into. Tell us a little bit about Praxis since we kind of got on the topic. What was the goal there? Yeah, and, and Praxis is a fantastic company, still operating. Uh, you can find it at discoverpraxis.com. I was one of the founding team members there. I'd known the CEO founder for a couple of years when he was working at another job and kind of just stayed in touch with him. And then when I went off to college, I was doing quite well, but I was really bored. So I asked him, hey, can I work for you for free, like on the weekends, after class, stuff like that? He said, sure. And then after the company got a little bit of traction and he was able to work full time, he hired me full time to work with him. And then I was doing business development there. But what Praxis is, is an apprenticeship program. I like to call it an apprenticeship program for the 21st century, right? Like not putting people in becoming plumbers and electricians, although that's fantastic and we absolutely need more people to be doing that, but more like 
people go to college in order to get a degree. Why are they getting that degree? They're getting that degree to get a job. You can give me all the fluffy stuff all day that you want to talk about, like they're doing it, become more well-rounded people or for a liberal education. Everything on the brochures. Right, exactly. Everything on the brochures. And you, you can make the argument, like there are some thinkers I very much like and very much agree with on almost everything except for this, where they'll say like, that's the point of college. And it's like, okay, that might be the point of college, but that's not why people are going. And it's not what they're getting usually. It's, it's, it's just very, very rarely what they're getting. I can say I've spoken on, you know, dozens of college campuses now. The only one that I've ever been to that I've walked away, like, actually impressed by the quality of the students and not kind of not a little disturbed. Uh, and there are great students on every campus, right? And usually the ones that are inviting me are top-notch students. But you walk around the campus and you meet, like, average students there, right? The only one I've ever walked away from consistently impressed is Grove City College. Huh. Is that in Maryland? It's outside of Pittsburgh. It's about an hour north of Pittsburgh. And it's a unique kind of weird school. They don't take any federal funding, which makes them like particularly odd. There's a big selection effect there. Like it's a Christian college. So like the type of person who wants to go there is going to be a specific type of person. But, you know, go to any college campus and ask students, like, if you had to spend four years here, had the opportunity to spend four years here, spend the money you're spending, the time you're spending, but you would not get a degree at the end of the day, how many of you would still be here? In a room of 100 kids, I might have one raise their hand. You know what my reaction is to them? It's like, great, you should go become a professor, right? <laughs> yeah, you're a great academic. Yes, this is for you. The system is built for you. But the vast majority of people are going to get a job. And the number one question when you're asking about how can we actually innovate, it's like, how can you do something better, faster, cheaper? And if you talk to entrepreneurs in the United States today, it's really hard to hire. It's just hard to hire, period. And more and more people are going to college than ever before. Then, so, and if college is this process by which people become qualified to get jobs, then why is it harder to find someone who can actually be hired? And it's like, well, maybe because college isn't actually a good process for becoming qualified for a job, right? And in some ways, it's damaging. You know, I, I talk to startups about this a decent amount, and they say pretty consistently that they don't like hiring kids right out of college because they don't actually know how to work right? Like they know how to get grades and stuff, but they don't know how to like show stuff early to get feedback. They don't know how to go figure things out on their own. Um, they focus on the wrong things. And so they don't want somebody until they've actually gone and had a bit of experience first. Right. And I've recently hired a business partner and I hired um, someone. Now he'd actually been through Praxis, but he's 17 years old, right? Novice software developer. So like he can do some software development. He's, he's not like this major whiz kid that can like build Ethereum at 17 or something. But smart, hardworking, and does not have a lot of the bad habits that you pick up in a university. And I would much rather hire someone like that nine times out of ten. And so, so the idea behind Praxis was, okay, what if we could give some people some basic professional development training, give them a coach, an advisor, who can coach them through a process, and then put them in a quickly growing company for you know six months, nine months, 12 months, short period of time. And how many of those people do you think are going to get hired at the end of the day? And a lot of them do get hired. So that was the idea behind Praxis. And I was doing business development there. So I was the person who had to go sit down with a CEO or uh, a president of a company and tell them like, hey, take a risk on this 18-year-old right out of high school or take a risk on this 20-year-old college dropout. You, they're going to be as good as, if not better, than most people that you hire. How do you convince them to take that on? Because especially in a startup your bandwidth is so limited for training and taking on somebody in that role. So how would you show them that it would be valuable? So the first thing you do is you move them out of what's called a nirvana fallacy. So like a lot of people, you especially get this when people are talking about uh, higher education in the abstract, people operate by what's called the nirvana fallacy, which is you're going to compare a real world alternative to this nirvana that you have painted in your mind, right? So when, when you're talking about college, generally, people will be like, well, this is the, where people go to become educated and it's members of a liberal society. And it's like, no, actually compared against the reality of what's going on. It's, so it's like the opposite. It's not like a steel man, but it's kind of like the opposite of a straw man where you're taking like this ridiculously flowery picture. So first of all, you move them out of that and you're like, OK, what is it actually like for you guys to hire? And hiring is painful no matter what kind of process you have set up for it. And for startups, you have to hire someone, you have to onboard them, you have to train them, and you have to make sure that they're like producing value pretty damn quickly because you can't afford to just have a, a massive training program like Goldman Sachs does. 
So what for startups, the pitch would usually be like, okay, look, this is going to be a painful process for you regardless. So we can make it less painful by going out and finding someone who is qualified to work with you. And they have been through several months of professional development with us already. So a lot of the things that you would need to spend several weeks ironing out when they get in the door here will already be ironed out with them. In addition to that, they have a one-on-one advisor who's going to be working with them while they're working with you. So if it's like, oh shit, this person actually needs to pick up Python, or let's say they need to pick up like JavaScript and they're like a Python developer. And I will actually, real quick as an aside, I will say actually very few of the practice positions are highly technical. Most of them are in like sales and business development. Yeah, that was going to be my question is if it's just for developers, but it sounds like it's not. No, it's, that's my bad for using the developer example. A lot of them are like sales and business development and marketing. And so we tell them like, okay, well, we actually have this entire advising coaching program that they'll be receiving. Any employee you hire off the street is not going to be receiving that. So there's a value add in addition to just the fact that we're going out and finding them. So it, Praxis is not a recruiter. It's, it's not really a job training program. It's, it's like a thing unto itself. So that exposed me to a lot of ambitious young people and a lot of not so ambitious young people, not in Praxis, but you know, going around talking to campuses. And a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners, which was a, a fascinating set of experiences. So when you joined, you said you're doing biz dev, right? When I joined at the very, very beginning, it was just me and the CEO and then our education director. So it was a little bit of everything. Anyone who's ever started a company knows that everybody does a little bit of everything early on. The CEO was doing biz dev because he was a fundraiser for a nonprofit, actually one of the nonprofits that's at this event that I'm at here today. And a lot of the donors were like business owners, right? So he was able to pull his Rolodex from that as like the basic business partner network. And then as the company grew, we needed a dedicated business development person. And that's a fun story. You know, we put out a call to hire someone. Our idea was we'd hire someone with 10 years of C-suite experience to come in and just plug us into their Rolodex. And like, especially a couple of years ago, what Praxis was doing is weird. So you wouldn't find a lot of people who would actually understand, like people either get it or they don't, right? Like I explained it to them and they were like, oh yeah, that's awesome. It makes a ton of sense. I wish that was around when I was younger. And if, if anyone would ever say that when I was doing business development, that would make them a fantastic business partner. That was the tell. Or they'd be like, so you're recruiters or you run an internship program. It's like, okay, this is not going to work. So we were hiring for this business development director position, and we'd probably interviewed a number of candidates. It was dragging on a couple of weeks at this point. So I left our office, went to a cigar shop, put together a proposal of like what I would do if I was the business development director. And like I'm like 20, maybe 21 at this stage. No experience talking to CEOs, entrepreneurs, besides anyone that I knew growing up. And I sent it over to the CEO, came back in the office. He looked at me, he's like, there's one big problem with your proposal. I'm like, okay, what's that? And he's like, it's too good. <laughs> so I'm going to have to hire someone to replace you while you go and do that. So I did that for a couple of years, which is, a, like I said, a fascinating set of experiences, really, really enjoyable. Yeah. How did you prove that you were qualified for it? Either when you were pitching it to him or when you guys first started working together? Because you started working with him when you were 19, 20 and still in college, right? Yeah, I was probably 18 or 19. I'd known him since I was like 16. Not, not super, super well, but we stayed in touch. And I think through that first year, I proved to him that when I am very deeply interested in something, which I was very much with Praxis, I'm a highly effective person. Going back to personality type stuff, one of the things that I think is really, really important to try to keep, it's hard to measure it, but to keep track of in yourself is a sense of self-efficacy. How effective are you? Like, if you say you're going to do something, do you do it? And this is also kind of a function of conscientiousness. So like someone who's highly conscientious, they're very good at making plans and executing upon them. And I'm very much that personality, right? And I think he saw that. So he had a year, a little bit more than a year to show like, okay, Zach might not have the references. He might not have the skills yet, but he can probably gain them and he can gain them pretty quickly. Let's try it, right? As for like proving myself, it was a more interesting experience when I'd go in and sit down with founders because I looked like I was like 20, right? (laughs) And often they would give me a funky look. And sometimes that worked to my benefit because I think older people have... I think a fair bias against young people where they're like, they're going to discount you the minute you walk in the door, which it can be to your advantage if you are actually competent. You don't need to like blow them out of the water with competence. You just need to be competent. They're going to be like, wow, I found a competent young person. This is weird. So that was one benefit for me. Uh, the other was just being very clear and committed to the goal that the company was trying to achieve. 
like I said, people either got it or they didn't. And if they didn't, then you just you cut your losses and you move on, right? Were there any projects before working with him that you had sort of done on your own that set you up to be able to take on some of this responsibility? Directly with him, no. The only thing that I would note is, so I, I'm very interested in the concept of, I hate the word mentor, but the importance of finding a mentor. And he would cringe if I would ever call him my mentor. But he kind of was while I was in high school. I met a, at a seminar and stayed in touch with him. And you know, if you find someone who's like that and they say something, if they give advice in the audience, do that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's the best way to follow up with them too. Yeah, and then let them know. Like he noted to this audience, 100 people, you know, like write an article and send it into your local letter to the editor or something. And I did that. I did it a couple times. Uh, and like that one specific article, and again, I was like 16 when I wrote it, maybe 17. That one specific article got reprinted at a uh, major think tank, and then it got reprinted in the Christian Science Monitor, and then it got picked up. One of the academics I mentioned in the letter to the editor found it, emailed me, connected me to a professor at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh who invited me to another set of seminars. Just because I actually listened to the guy when he said, like, go do this thing. And I followed up with him. And I was able to stay in touch with him. So I think that was really helpful. What was the article about? Uh, so I grew up in a little rural town in Pennsylvania that one of the things that was an issue in the town was a major highway just ended in the middle of the town. Yeah, it was, it was very, very odd. U.S. Route 219, which you could take from our town north, but you couldn't really take it south unless you got onto like, so it was a closed highway and it became an open highway because it just ended. So I made the radical case. What if we just privatize the highway? Like give it over to a set of companies that can manage it. They can try to fund it however they want to see fit. They could put tolls on it. Or even more interestingly, like you can fund highways without usage fees, tolls, and taxes. You can fund them through like advertising. I could put a number of different ads on the highway that actually go to the company that maintains the highway. And like highways are great places to put advertising because you've got a captive audience that has nothing else to look at. Can you actually make enough money off of billboards and stuff to fund building a highway? That, that's an economics question. I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't be able to do it to fund it with cash, right? But you could do it over a multi-year period, I'm confident. And like a closed highway, I actually think has lower maintenance costs than open highways. So like one issue you run into in rural Pennsylvania is the open highways get destroyed by the coal trucks. They get really worn down. They get really beat up by coal trucks. Whereas like open highways, it's more like tractor trailers and it's a fairly flat grade. So you don't really run into nearly as many issues like that. But advertising was just one of the examples of ways you can fund it. So as on the radio wavelengths that are specifically in that area, you could do usage fees. I'm actually a big fan of usage fees. I think the tolls make sense. They make a lot more sense than like making someone on the other side of the state pay for your highway. But people don't like tolls for, you know, kind of obvious reasons. So that was, that, was, that was a fun article that I wrote, passed along. Just kind of stayed in touch with him on that. I worked on a number of different projects in college. I was on the executive board of student nonprofit that contributed a little bit to my leadership abilities. I was actually, for being someone who's like so anti-academia, I was actually training to become an academic. <laughs> <laughs> you were studying philosophy, right? Yeah, I was. I had everything like set up for me if I wanted to follow that path. Like people who told me, we'll help you get into the University of Arizona, which at the time was like the number one and number two political philosophy program in the in the world. If you want to do that for grad school, I had a mentor at Penn. She actually ended up getting hired away by another university right around the same time that the Praxis opportunity came up. So I was like, huh, I guess that's a sign. Helped your decision. Yeah, yeah. It's a sign from the universe to make a decision, so... Yeah, well, let's talk about that decision, because at some point after you started working with Praxis, you decided to just leave school entirely, right? Yeah. So how did you decide to do that? What did that time look like? Uh, so I went and I started working full time with the Praxis team, worked about a year doing that. I took a leave of absence, which like most people don't realize you can take a leave of absence from your college at essentially zero cost. The only cost is the time, which I think is actually much more an investment kind of decision. So I checked with everyone at the university and I was like, okay, I want to take this leave to work full time on this. I had plans of coming back. I confirmed that I could do it, that I wouldn't lose my financial aid, things like that. And then about a year in, I remember sitting in the office and looking over at the CEO of the company and just being like, I don't think I'm going to go back. And well, I was thinking about it. I'm like, the rate at which I am growing now is actually much higher than the rate when I'm in the university. Because there's all these distractions in the university that are not actually contributing to both my short-term and my long-term development. 
So it was a much more conservative decision. Like my friend Derek, who is the head of marketing now at Praxis, he pretty much just got up and like left during a final <laughs> and pretty much said like, F this. Um, Which I'm sure like everyone has imagined doing at some point in their college career. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, he actually did it. So, you know, kudos to him. Yeah, it's badass. <laughs> like, I think he got up and he left to, like, go to a Ron Paul rally or something and then just decided not to come back. So kudos to him. But my story was a bit more conservative in the sense that it was like, I am an advocate for I don't like generalizations, right? I think that leaving the university is going to be a better decision for a lot more people than people think. And that, I realize that's a very um, hedged statement. If you want to be a doctor, great. Keep doing it, right? You need to do it, unfortunately. You want to be a lawyer, okay. That's your grave you're digging. But you don't actually legally need to have a college degree, but it's going to be very, very hard to become a lawyer without a college degree. But like a lot of other jobs, it's actually a lot easier to get hired and promoted and to continue growing in that job without the degree than you think it is. You just need to be creative. What did the conversation with your parents look like? I explained it very evenly to both my parents. My dad was like, he wasn't entirely on board, but he was like, okay, you know, this is your decision to make. And I could tell his support, he did eventually support it, came from a place of like, I know you're smart and and I know you're conscientious and I know you're going to find out how to succeed regardless, which is like what I tell if we back up for a second, people will love to pull out the statistic that it's like, oh, having a college degree or a million dollars more in your lifetime is, well, maybe it's that like smart, conscientious people tend to go to college, not that college makes them smart and conscientious. There's a selection effect, right? Those people will probably be successful regardless of what they do. Yeah, you're not seeing all of the data on them if they didn't go to college. Right. You'd have to run like a bunch of experiments that are just like hard experiments to run. My mom was not on board and I ended up getting like a, a lengthy email from one of my aunts who is a college professor, of course, uh, essentially telling me that I was making a very bad decision. I deleted the email and went about making my decision. So, so it, but it ended up working out with your parents. Yeah. Yeah, it did end up working out. So I, and yeah, I understand why parents are going to want to make that risk averse pushing to get that degree. And to a certain extent, I think it, it actually goes to a deeper issue with parenting is like for a lot of people, and I don't think this is unhealthy, being a parent, being a good parent is going to be one of the biggest achievements they ever have in their life. And it's not an easy thing to do. So it is a big achievement, but we don't have very clear metrics what that means. <laughs> so we've developed heuristics. And I think one of those heuristics is you raise your kid and they go and they, they graduate from college. Yay. But that doesn't mean you're a good parent. <laughs> a lot of people are pushing their kids to get that because the parent wants that affirmation, maybe not consciously, but they want that affirmation that they're a good parent. Or they want to tell their friends what college their kid is going to and graduated from. Yeah. If you catch me on a more cynical day, I would definitely wholeheartedly endorse that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it is a big part of it. It's like there is some. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's just status symbol. Absolutely. Yeah. Ego and uncertainty to it. W when did you make the switch to doing more writing? So I wrote a book that was a compilation of writings I had done about a year ago. My advice for people when it comes to writing is read read. And as you read, you're going to get ideas of what to write about, right? If you go like click through my blog at zackslayback.com, almost everything I've blogged about is because I was reading about something on that topic at the time. And if you don't think you have a, an original contribution to give, you're wrong. Everybody has an angle that they can give on any kind of topic. And you posting a blog does not mean that there's fewer people who can post blogs out there. Like there's no scarcity to these things. So I was, I was reading a lot about education about two years ago. I devoured a number of books on the topic and I wrote a lot about it and it made sense since, you know, I was working at Praxis and I was like, oh yeah, I've got like a hundred thousand words of this. Like I could make a book out of this. So I did. And I put that out last year. That's the end of school. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Fun little book that, you know, looks at K-12 education, higher education, getting a job without a degree, hiring people without a degree, a bunch of different topics. But I was really, really wanted to get back into doing that. And that's like kind of some deep work. Like that requires a lot of sitting down and reading. Like Cal Newport has this idea of deep work where you're, you're doing work for extended periods of time that you're not distracted and you're focused. And the pace was picking up at Praxis to a point where as the person in charge of business development for a long time, I also was the one who placed specific participants at specific companies. And that is not a deep work kind of job. <laughs> Um, like you get a phone call from a business partner and you have to take it or you're responding to a bunch of different text messages about like how to do an interview and stuff like that. And like, it's a great job and someone needs to do it, but it was not what I wanted to be doing. So I, I shifted my attention back into writing earlier this year around March 
and I've been writing on a number of topics since then. So is that pretty much most of the work you're doing now? Because you're also head of publishing for the mission, right? Yeah, and that the great thing about that job is like that's a lot of writing. <laughs> And like, sometimes it's writing like things that I wouldn't otherwise be writing about. Like I know a lot about marketing and branded content now, which I, I did not know before. But I started doing that in March in a slightly different capacity and that evolved into becoming director of publishing there. Uh, the mission is one of the largest publications on Medium. We have over 340,000 direct subscribers who get our information every single day. Fantastic, fun publication, you know. We like to say that we publish content that makes smart people smarter. And that, that's a lot of the stuff that I like to focus on and I like to write about, you know, like self-help and personal and professional development for smart people. Not like this Stuart Smalley, like, you're perfect, you're wonderful, and by golly, people like you. <laughs> like, no, like, maybe you need to wake up earlier and maybe you're not waking up earlier because you're lazy, right? Like being able to tell people stuff like that. So I, I do that and then I do a lot of writing I also advise a number of startups in the education and software space. So my time is spent on a, a number of different things, but I, I really enjoy it that way. Yeah. Well, what's your goal with a lot of the education stuff? Do you want to see like a move away from the existing college system or more like on the student side, people thinking about it differently? Or how do you think about it? You know, again, I don't like to give generalizations. For some people, going to college is going to be the best thing for them. Uh, however, I think that for a lot of people right now with the current setup in, in universities, both the fact that they're not preparing people for the real world and the fact that there's like this really insidious infection of like really bad thinking, especially in the humanities. Like I saw a friend of mine when I was in college literally pickle his mind on postmodernism. Like this idea that the whole world comes down to power structures and that those power structures are about oppression. And it's like, no, that's wrong. There are hierarchies in the world, but they're competence hierarchies. Like you want to reward people who are good at doing things because then they'll keep doing those things, right? And like, man, that stuff is really insidious and it's really, it's bleeding into a lot of disciplines. And I, that's, that's a whole nother, another discussion there. I don't want people to think that the default is that if you're a smart, competent young person, you should go to college. That's the thing I want to see, where that's an option in the buffet of things available to you that maybe for what you want to achieve, it is the best thing you should do. But maybe you should actually go work at a company. Maybe you should launch your own company. I meet young people who are like in high school and they're trying to launch a company and I ask them why they're trying to do it. And it's because they wanted to put it on their resume to get into college. And I'm like, no, that's the wrong reason to start a company. Don't do that. <laughs> that's a very bad idea. You're not going to be happy. And I, but unfortunately, a lot of this goes back to the K through 12 level as well. This kind of thinking, kind of uh, very linear thinking is kind of beaten into people from a very early age. And it, it's just a function of you're going to get that kind of thinking when you have to group like 30 or 40 people together to teach them all at once. Like there's probably as many paths forward as there are people in that room. And you're going to need to find the least common denominator. And also when you put them all on that same path, getting into college and everyone focuses on it for 12 years, as soon as they get there, they look for very similar comfortable paths they can jump on, right? I think you mentioned this in your book too, right? The six or so careers that everyone seems to track themselves into because they feed very nicely on that same mentality. Yeah. And then there's also this kind of insidious effect that you get when you get a bunch of people together. People are imitative creatures by nature, right? That's neither good nor bad. That's just a, you know, a statement. I'm not making a judgment about it. But many of the things we like, we like because other people like them. And other people like them because other people like them, right? And that just keeps going on and on. It's turtles all the way down. And I saw this at Penn where I had friends and acquaintances and classmates my first year who they wanted to be doctors and lawyers and entrepreneurs and artists, right? And all these different things. And like maybe one or two of them wanted to be investment bankers and consultants. But like by the beginning of the junior year, almost everybody wanted to go into investment banking and consulting. And that's weird. That should not happen. And that's part of this imitative cycle when you get people together like that. Anything less is, is seen as a waste of an Ivy League degree, which again, I, I think is pretty insidious. I'm not sure if I answered your question there. I apologize. No, no. I mean, I feel like you did in, in its own way. I, I mean, I was going to go off of that and say it's definitely weird that there would be that much homogenous decisions amongst like such a diverse group initially. There's probably some element, too, of just what salaries people can see when they graduate. I think William Derezowitz, he has this great line in Excellent Sheep where he's like, there's this certain mentality, especially in Ivy Leagues, that by virtue of having an Ivy League degree, you think you're entitled to make seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 as soon as you graduate. And there's only a few jobs that offer that and everyone ends up getting tracked into them. 
Right. That's an interesting point that I hit on both in the end of school and in my forthcoming book that, you know, this is again, people, ah, statistics. Uh, I love statistics, like the actual study of statistics and understanding it well. But like one of the things that my stats teacher in high school taught me very, very early on is you can prove anything with statistics, right? You can prove any point or you can give, you can give credence and officiality to any point that you want to make. And the salaries one is one that really, really bothers me because it's just such sloppy thinking. Well, first of all, look at the fact that almost all of these career reports are voluntary response. So you spent a quarter million dollars in four years of your life at an Ivy League institution. You're getting paid $35,000 a year at a nonprofit in D.C. Do you really think that you're going to feel great about sending that information back to your alma mater? Probably not. So their information gets left out. So I think that the salaries tend to skew higher because of that. Two, look at the regions that people are moving to, right? They're almost all moving to New York or to San Francisco, LA or Chicago or Boston. And usually they're like living in Manhattan or they're like living in San Francisco. And you need to make seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year to live in Manhattan or San Francisco at a minimum. If you want to be comfortable, that's for sure. Right. So and I don't even mean like comfortable. I mean, just to like with your student loans and for to keep up with the rat race of your job. Yeah, it's like a bare minimum. Take a cost of living calculator and take, you know, seventy five thousand dollars a year and figure out how much you would be earning if you had to move to like Cleveland or Pittsburgh or Memphis or somewhere like that. And you'll see that's what that salary actually is. It might still be a good salary for that region, but like, like I live in Pittsburgh and, you know, we've got some really fantastic, well-paying jobs in Pittsburgh. Most of them are in medicine and in software, but it's a very low cost of living city. So you could move from New York to Pittsburgh and actually take a pay cut and still actually have a higher quality of life. Oh yeah. I've got an article on this actually sort of doing some of that math where if you were making 75K in New York and you moved to, I used Austin as the example, right? But if you moved there and you were making like 55, 60, you would actually end up taking home more money after all the adjustments just because like price difference is so huge. Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's a huge point. So like, man, I'll meet high schoolers who are trying to make their college decision based on which college has a higher reported median income and it's like, man, these are kids who like took AP stats too. I'm like, <laughs> you should know better. <laughs> yes, you should understand this. <laughs> Have you read that book, How to Lie with Statistics? I think I own a copy of it. I don't think I've read it. It's fantastic. And it's actually written kind of as a how-to manual to like fudge numbers and all of this. It, you know, satirical, obviously, but they do an awesome job of just breaking down all the ways that people can just mess with the data like this and make everything look different than it is. Oh, I've, I've got an acquaintance who is a philosophy professor at Georgetown who will make the point that like people think that used car salesmen are sleazy. College marketers are sleazy, man. Like in his specific case, the point he makes is that uh, philosophy departments will try to say like, look how much money our graduates make because a lot of people don't enroll in philosophy. And it's like, well, they make that money because someone who's interested in philosophy and is good at philosophy is probably, again, highly conscientious kind of thinker, right? They're going to do well in whatever job they're in. It's not because they majored in philosophy. Sorry. No, wrong. Well, and it's also if they had the balls to graduate with a philosophy degree and not go into academia, they're probably knowing that they can take care of themselves and do other things. Right. Especially at the higher institutions, right? Like at uh, UPenn and places. So actually going back to that, because we touched on this a little bit before, but to do the stuff that Praxis does, where you like go out and do these apprenticeships at startups. And I know we're probably going to have a number of people listening now who are thinking, okay, I want to get off of those like six paths a little bit. What are the other kinds of work that you've seen besides development and sales that tend to work really well for kids going straight in and doing these apprenticeships? Like what can people get good at? You know, social skills are really, really important. Uh, and maybe that's a function of sales, but actually understanding how to talk to people like, man, oh, I, so I have an acquaintance in Austin who he worked at Clarium Capital, which is uh, one of Peter Thiel's hedge funds for a while. And he got hired there specifically because he can actually talk to people. When you say talk to people, like, what do you mean? Like, he's not weird. Like, don't be weird. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's like, a good one. Be weird. Like, I'm weird. But like, have weird interests. You be eccentric. Yeah. Yeah, be eccentric. But don't like learn how to talk to someone, make eye contact with them, you know, understand like that they are a human being and that they have certain things they want to achieve and that people like to have their ego stroked, right? Do that in like a non-sleazy way. Um, I encourage people, 
I don't want to say like, these are the six tracks that if you learn these skills, you'll become very, very talented. No, wrong. I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think that what you need to do is you need to develop like a meta skill of seeing opportunity and seeing value that's being dropped, right? And I think one of the best ways to do that, and this is a big point that I kind of lead off my forthcoming book about, is there's a concept in economics called opportunity cost, which is like, what is the value of the next highest value thing you could be doing with your time? And like you and I, you know, we probably have like moderately high opportunity costs, but like someone who is 40, 50, 60 years old into their career, very, very good at their career has a much higher opportunity cost than we do. And like, there's this old added, this old idea that for Bill Gates to stop and pick up a hundred dollar bill, he actually destroys more value than if he were working. Right. So there's crazy, absurd examples like Bill Gates and like billionaires and people like that. But like, you don't need to find a billionaire and help a billionaire with their time. So if you're a young person listening to this right now, and you're not some sort of whiz kid or anything like that, that's okay. Because what that means is that you have very low opportunity cost, which means you can afford opportunity wise to go do stuff that other people who have higher opportunity costs don't have the time to do. So find someone who has higher opportunity costs than you for whom like there is something that they are not doing because it's just not worth their time to do that for you would actually be like a really valuable thing for you to do. There's kind of the sweet spot somewhere in there. Find those people and ingratiate yourself to them. You know, don't be a sleaze, but find something that you can do to help them. You know, maybe it's going to be with like building a new website for them. And it doesn't have to be a fancy website, even if it's like on Weebly, like a drag and drop website like that or WordPress it does not have to be fancy. Maybe offer to do some editing for them or offer if they have like, if they're starting a podcast, you know, offer to do some of the audio editing for them. So you have to leverage that with another skill, which is the skill to like learn very quickly, right? Then a a meta skill. Uh, If you can learn quickly, then you can tell them like, I don't have experience editing audacity files or something, but I can learn quickly. Here's an example of me learning quickly in the past. Let me do this for, you know, for free or for very minimal pay. And you'll be happy with the quality of work I put together. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you read uh, Charlie Hohen's Recession Proof Graduate or seen it? I have not. Uh, Okay, well, he talks a lot about this methodology because he graduated in 08, like straight into the recession and couldn't get hired for anything. And then figured out basically the same thing that you just talked about, that he could get really good at a couple of things, video editing, site building um, and a bit of marketing. And then he just pitched these entrepreneurs saying, hey, I'll work for you for free on this one project. We'll see how it goes. And then we can talk about doing paid stuff. He ended up working with Ramit Sethi, Tucker Max, Tim Ferriss. I think he worked with Seth Godin for a bit. But it's like a really effective strategy that I think a lot of kids don't think about. I mean, that was how I got started in marketing initially too. I just found someone who needed to subcontract out some internet marketing work that he didn't have the time for. And I was like, hey, I'll do it, right? Like, <laughs> happy to underbill for it just to learn. And you absolutely do not need to find like a Ramit Sethi or a Tim Ferriss. No, definitely not. There is someone like you could be listening to this in like some bumble nowhere hometown in like middle America. And there's someone in your hometown who you can do this for. In fact, those people I think are the sweet spot because, you know, someone who's already hyper successful they can hire like a virtual assistant. They can hire any number of people, right? Like money does not buy you more time, but it buys you other people's time. And that's that's important. So yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but everybody who works on my team right now with the podcast and the site and stuff, they all reached out from reading and were like, hey, I want to learn how to do this thing. We can try it for free. And then if it works out, like build a relationship. And I've hired at least four or five really great people that way. Oh yeah, my book editor, I, I put out a call on my blog for someone to help me edit my book. Uh, like put all my articles together, make them make sense, actually do editing, like copy editing. And a student at a local liberal arts college reached out to me. She offered to do it for free. I ended up paying her a little bit because she did such a fantastic job. And she's now the head editor at the mission. And she edits my podcast for me as well. She's fantastic. She's one of the most competent people I've met. And I will refer anyone to her if she's looking for an opportunity. So I 100% agree. Oh, and it looks so much better. If you were going to go apply to a traditional job, right, saying that you edited this person's book and put it together versus like, hey, I worked on my school newspaper, right? (laughs) It's night and day. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I will say it was interesting. I had a number of people apply for that position. And these were all people in the Pittsburgh region. I had a number of students apply from a rather prestigious university in the city that I will leave unnamed that... uh, Is it Carnegie? Uh, that that, <laughs> that shall shall remain unnamed. Uh, who honestly, like, 
and then this girl applied, and she was from some no-name liberal arts school in the area, and she just blew them out of the water, man, like, for everything, like, her responsiveness, her professionalism, you know, at that age, in that level of experience, you might think you're a good copy editor, but, you know, you're either a good one or just a bad one. There's no one who's, like, fantastic. Like, one girl, man, sent me, I asked for a writing sample. And this is another thing, going back to, like, the finding mentors thing, like, do your research, please. Um, I asked for a writing sample and I just published an article about how the gas industry had just collapsed and it was an analysis on like why the gas industry collapsed. And I'm pretty open about the fact I like natural gas. I'm actually like fairly pro fossil fuels within reason. And I think that the natural gas industry is like one of the most unfairly vilified industries in the country. And I make that point in this article. And this girl sends me an article she wrote for her school newspaper about how the natural gas industry is like destroying America. And I'm like, man, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but like, please just do your yeah. research. <laughs> it's a little careless. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know this. I went to Carnegie Mellon, actually. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. You, well, that, that makes sense, given how we were introduced. Yeah, exactly. So that was part of my frustration when I was there was that you have this so-called amazing institution where nobody graduates actually knowing how to do anything for the most part. Yeah, I have you know a number of friends who are still there who some of them are like really fantastic developers, but they're fantastic developers because of things they did that were not at CMU. And I recently had to hire a software person and I thought like, oh, you know, great, there's CMU right here. Like, no one knows, like there's maybe like two good mobile developers on the whole campus. And you should expect that there'd be a lot more. Well, and there's a big difference between doing a coding challenge assigned to you that's, you know, in this very narrow frame and like building an app from the ground up and understanding how to do like user testing and working with designers and marketers and all of that, right? They're almost two different skill sets. You know, one is part of the other, obviously, but there's so much more on top of it that you never really get exposed to in school unless you go out and do your own projects. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask, you seem like you do a lot of this introspection, like trying to learn more about yourself. Is there anything that was really helpful to you when you were younger to figure out some of these interests? Or recently? I mean, it doesn't have to be from before either. That's a really good question. And I know you did self-authoring recently, so we could talk about that too. Yeah, have you talked about the self-authoring program on your uh, podcast yet? You know, I haven't, but it came up like three or four times in the last couple of weeks. And then I was doing my research on you and it's like your most recent blog post. So I feel like it's one of those weird things where you just start seeing something everywhere. And then you say like, okay, I have to go do this. So I'm curious about your experience with it. Yeah, so I pushed back for a couple of years against anything that I, I sensed as like being kind of self-helpy, which I think is, is something you'll find a lot of people who like while they're growing up, they're being told like, you're so smart, yay, will do because they're like, well, yeah, I don't need that stuff. I don't need that stuff, right? And it's like, no, wrong. You do need it. <laughs> you You don't know all the forces that are at play on your mind, right? You think you are king of your mind. You are not. Your mind is an amalgam of all these different pieces that are like pushing and pulling back and forth constantly. If you've ever like flipped out on your significant other while you're hungry, for example, like that's a good example. Like you do or you say something because it's like very base primal thing and it could like legitimately destroy your future life. So no, you actually need to take the time to do introspection. You need to take the time to try to understand yourself. Then you need to combine it with actually going out and doing stuff in the world, right? I think that's where people who are like very introspection oriented go wrong is like, I'll meet people who they've done like a ton of different things like self-authorship or different personal and professional development things. Then they don't go do anything. Like you're becoming a more effective person so that you can go do things, right? So it's a lot easier to just keep doing self-helpy stuff and keep reading books than to go out and apply them. Right. Absolutely. And I think that's entirely the wrong way of approaching personal development. So there were a number of things that were really, really helpful for me. Uh, growing up, like I said, I, I pushed back against a lot of this stuff. But one, actually, like philosophy was actually really, really helpful for me to study. I will say that. I specifically studied a subset of philosophy known as moral psychology. And moral psychology focuses on the intersection of our emotions and why our emotions are as significant as they are. So I developed a course, actually, a majors only seminar at Penn. This is part of a research fellowship I did on reactive attitudes like resentment, indignation, and guilt. And like, what do those mean? Why does resentment happen? And who is the target of resentment? How do you resolve resentment? Things like that, which sounds like psychology, but it's actually a subset of philosophy. That was really, really helpful because it made me stop and realize, oh, there's actually like significance and meaning to each of these kinds of things that I feel and do throughout the day, right? 
and I, I've dabbled in different subsets of personal development. Um, there's a fantastic group. They're pretty quiet uh, about what they do, but you can find their stuff on their website and some of their materials that I did a training with earlier this year called Leverage Research in Paradigm Academy. They operate from a philosophy of the mind that every single decision you make is connected to a belief that you hold. And you can explicate that belief. So that's an interesting challenge against most people operating on autopilot most of the time. Like if you're doing something weird, why are you doing it? You can actually sit down and you can like sift through your mind and figure out what the belief is that's making you do that weird thing. So again, that was helpful too. But self-authoring is one of these things that where, you know, again, going back to the way that smart people push up against self-help and personal development, like you should set goals. <laughs> people set goals. Right. <laughs> this is, so the self-authoring suite was a so we can get that elephant out of the room so people understand what we're talking about. It's a essentially a journaling program that was developed by a number of psychologists, uh, the most prominent of which is clinical psychologist in Toronto named Jordan Peterson, who what they've developed is a future authoring, present authoring and past authoring program where you log in and it gives you certain prompts and you respond to those prompts. And this is one of the reasons I love to write. Writing is like, for me, thinking. I clarify a lot of my thinking when I write. So they'll ask you in the future authoring one, which is the one that I, if you've had traumatic events in your past, the past authoring one, I think could be very, very helpful for people. Um, the, I really find the future authoring one very, very helpful for people who would like listen to this podcast, because if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably interested in actually achieving stuff. So it asks you to like figure out what your strengths are and what is the life that you actually want to live and how can you get there? What are the goals that you actually need to set? And people are afraid of setting goals, man. They're, they're very afraid of it. There's a number of reasons for that. I think one is people are afraid of setting goals because when you set a goal, a goal is essentially a condition for success, right? Like I want to achieve X by this date and a specific goal. You should set specific goals. I think it's Tony Robbins who has something where it's like, Oh, you want to lose weight? Okay, you've lost a pound. Now get out of here, right? You want to earn more money? Here's a dollar. Get out of here. Like set specific goals. But when you set specific goals, you're setting specific conditions for success. And if you're setting a condition for success, you're also setting a condition for failure. And if you're someone who's always been successful in your life, you don't want to fail. It's going to be an attack on your personal identity. Like that's very jarring for a lot of people. So I think a lot of people avoid setting goals for that reason. They find ambitious things they can do that people will be like, ooh, isn't that so ambitious of you? Isn't that so good? But they don't actually set like a very specific goal of something they want to achieve and think about why do I want to achieve it? What are the obstacles I'm going to run into when I'm trying to achieve that goal? And how can I achieve that goal? So this isn't specific to the self-authoring program, but I've sort of developed, like I said, everything I write is an amalgam of everything I'm reading at the time. But that's really how the whole world works, right? If you're struggling to figure out how to get to your goal, I've developed something that I call ambition mapping, where you think about what is the thing you're trying to achieve. You want to get a specific job or you want to live in a specific kind of way and work backwards from achieving that, right? Use what's called reverse induction. Okay, so like I want to become, I want to launch a venture capital fund. Let's say that, right? And in order to launch a venture capital fund, I either need to have a liquid net worth of a million dollars or I need to raise $5 million minimum in order to get the SEC accreditation that I need to get. Uh, okay, let's say I want to go with the latter of those two. I want to raise $5 million. Okay, how do I raise $5 million? And you work backwards from, I have raised $5 million. You work backwards from there. What are all the things you would need to accomplish in order to get there? And you'll eventually get to like where you are sitting right now. And that is the thing you should do. That is the thing you should do right now. Makes sense. And that is that something that you have in an article or where can people find that? Yeah, I have all my stuff at zackslayback.com, which I, so Z-A-K-S-L-A-Y-B-A-C-K.com. I encourage you to go there. But if you just Google ambition mapping, you'll find something either on my website or on the mission results. It's going to be one of the first results because all the results I see right here are all me, except for one person who's writing about something I wrote about. There's an article on Medium called How I Use Ambition Mapping to Navigate the Labyrinth of Life. It's always kind of fun when you can just tell somebody to Google something. I don't know about you, but I always get like a little bit of satisfaction out of that. <laughs> One of my favorite things on the internet is let me Google that for you. Oh, yeah, that's the best. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really an asshole kind of thing. to. Oh, it's so with. snarky. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, One of the guys I work with the other day asked me some kind of question that I knew the answer. Was, oh, he was asking me like, what's the size of the bed of a pickup truck? I'm like, man, that, that's a pretty standard thing. So I just pulled up, let me Google that for you and just sent that to him. And he was like, okay, fair. I, I got your point. I got your point. <laughs> it's kind of generational. It's kind of also mindset too. 
of how people think about that stuff is some people I find will default to like asking someone else and some people will default to just looking it up themselves. Well, that's, you know, going back to the question about professional development, know how to Google stuff. Yeah, it's a good skill. Yeah, it is. It's a good skill for anything because it doesn't require you to burn social capital by asking questions to people, right? And it's also, even in like, especially in software developing, like 90% of software development is knowing what to Google. Oh, yeah. Unless you're working at the like absolute fringe edges where you're creating new stuff, like at least 80, 90%, like you said, is figuring out what to look up on Stack Overflow. Aside from the programs that we just talked about, are there any books that have had a really big impact on you? Just like books that you usually recommend heavily. Uh, I really like The Fountainhead. I think The Fountainhead is a fantastic book. There's a lot in it. It's not just the story of an architect who's against the grain. It's the story of self-discovery and living true to oneself and not all who are wonder are lost sticker on the back of a pink Jeep kind of way. It's a fantastic book. I really do recommend it. Any preconceived notions you have about Ayn Rand, just throw them away. Because I think, you know, whether they're fair or not, I don't want to address that question. The book is a book of fiction, right? It's not a political book. It's, it's very, very, very useful. I like to reread that every couple of years. I find that a really helpful book. I'm reading a book right now called Value Focused Thinking. So Tony Robbins has this idea that successful people ask the right questions, right? When I first heard that, and maybe it's because Tony Robbins said it, but when I first heard that, I kind of was like, oh, okay, whatever, that's just a platitude, right? So like, I will say, I think that guy's also been unfairly maligned. He's got some really fantastic stuff. He's very legit. It's his industry, I think, that ends up hurting him. It's everybody else in that field that makes him look bad almost. I would agree with that. His stuff is good. Like, Unlimited power is a lot of neuro-linguistic programming, which is another good example of something that I think actually does have a lot of substance to it, but a lot of the people who are practitioners of it are like really schmaltzy, non-substance people. Awaken the Giant Within, I think, is better of the two. Yeah, I think that's like one of the best self-improvement books out there, like Bang for Its Buck. You can like read that or you can read 10, 15 other books, and I think he just does it all in one. Oh, yeah. I read it. I devoured it. I only started reading his stuff last year, actually, when I had kind of a rough patch with a number of things in my life at the same time. And I devoured all of his stuff pretty quickly. And I was like, wow, this like I feel bad for not reading this guy's stuff sooner because I knew who he was. I don't know. I had written him off up until kind of last year. Me too. Absolutely. Value focused thinking, though, is a uh, book in like decision making and strategic decision making. So there is like some weird heavy mathematics in it. But it's a really good it goes back to this idea of like successful people ask the right questions. And the thesis of the book is that most decision making, we're never taught decision making in school, even though like most of our life, especially if we're in like a white collar kind of role is going to be decision making. So the default way that people make decisions is they decide between alternatives. Like, am I going to have the chicken or am I going to have the fish, right? You're not really asking a question. What are you trying to solve? You're trying to solve hunger in this case, right? Like, how can I best solve hunger, my own personal hunger? It's like, maybe it's not the chicken or the fish. Maybe there are a bunch of other options on the table that you've never even thought about, but you're asking the wrong question in the first place. So it's a really cool book. I like Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics as well. I think it's a good book to help you make you think more about the questions you need to ask. And I only recently picked it up, but Goethe's Faust is really good. So this is the classic story of like selling your soul to the devil. I read it through the lens of like drug use and drug abuse, where people will use certain types of drugs to, they think, make themselves better. But what they're actually doing is they're selling their soul to the devil in a certain metaphorical sense. Um, there's a bunch of ways you can read into it. It's free. It's available online. It's quite good. You send out a free book every week, right? Every Friday. Sign up at sexstayback.com. <laughs> Get the plug in there. And you've got a book coming out soon as well, right? You've mentioned it a couple times now. Yeah, I've got a book coming out this winter called How to Get Ahead When You Have Nothing to Offer. It essentially distills a lot of the stuff I've learned on professional and personal development. Like I said, the book opens up with this idea of opportunity cost and how you can leverage opportunity cost. But once you've leveraged that opportunity cost to essentially find a mentor, and again, I am averse to anything that's like, this is a mentorship program. This is a mentor things, right? Well, I think your example that your mentor would be embarrassed to hear you call him a mentor, that's usually a sign that it was a real good mentorship. Right, right. And like James Altucher has this idea that you can have virtual mentors too. Like if you read books by one person and you devour all of their content, you've gained a lot that you would gain if they were a mentor to you. 
right? So the book kind of opens up with the idea of leveraging opportunity costs to get new opportunities and find a mentor. And then I look into like other things like here's how you should set goals properly. Here's how you can recover from professional failure. Here's how you can land a job when a company isn't actually hiring, all these kinds of things. Nice. Well, when will it be up for pre-order? Do you know? It should be up for pre-order by end of October is what I'm thinking. So depending on when people are listening to this, you may be able to go out and find it. Yeah. I mean, if you just Google Google that, you'll find it there. You'll also be able to find it at getaheadlabs.com. Oh, okay. Very cool. Any last thoughts or things that maybe you thought of during the conversation that we didn't touch on that you wanted to bring up? Um, you know, no, this was a pretty dynamic conversation. I thought it was it was easy for me to wander between topics without, I think, getting too off topic. <laughs> That's good to hear, at least doing some of my job right. No, you're doing podcast interviewing well. It's it's uh, for anyone who's listening, that's actually not an easy thing to do well. I mean, on that topic, I've gone on some interviews and it's remarkable how unprepared or awkward I find some interviewers make it. Or that they're trying to use the interview to make their own points. And it's like, then just do your own podcast that isn't interviewing me, right? <laughs> yeah, just do speeches. <laughs> right. No, no, like I've got, I occasionally interview people for a podcast. It's on hiatus right now. I'm going to be launching the second season this fall. But if there's a point I want to make, I have a separate podcast. It's literally just like the Zach Slayback podcast that I just upload monologues to anytime I have a point that I really want to make via audio. How have you found people respond to that versus the interviews? The interviews are almost entirely selfish. I like to do them because it allows me the opportunity to meet and talk to cool people. Oh, you've caught me. That's why we're doing this too. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. It's like I do it as a consumption good for me if I can like distill interesting information and get it out to people too. Awesome. Cool. That's a, a good benefit. Uh, for the monologues, you know, people react well to them because not everyone has the time to like sit down and actually read a post. Well, some people really prefer the audio to the reading. For cert I find it like really varies for me depending on the type of information. I love listening to conversations or debates. I have a hard time listening to audiobooks or speeches. That's why I like to keep these kind of conversational, like you said, is that I feel like that's so much more natural for people to listen to because then like the audio format makes sense. I don't know. Do, do you like audiobooks? Uh, not particularly. Now, I travel a lot. You know, if you went to CMU, you know, Pittsburgh's like not an easy city to walk around or use public transit in. So I drive a lot both around town and I fly quite often. So audiobooks are helpful in that regard. But I love my Kindle, man. Like it was the best thing I bought in the last couple of years, besides maybe TSA PreCheck. So I didn't have like clammy blue hands touching me every couple of days. Yeah, PreCheck and Kindle and flying just become so much better. And a few good podcasts. <laughs> What's the name of your podcast that's on hiatus, by the way? So we get that in here too. Doers. Doers. Okay. And that's like on iTunes and everywhere? Yep. It's on iTunes. Uh, we have something like 20 interviews from the first season. I'm putting together the second season now, which I think will be you know between 10 and 20 episodes. Mostly entrepreneurs, but occasionally artists, intellectuals. People I find interesting and I want to talk to. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, so where else can people find you? We've got ZachSlayback.com. We've got the Doers podcast. We've got your book that is out, The End of School, which we'll link to. And then the forthcoming book, which people can look for. It's how to get ahead when you have nothing to offer. Matt, anywhere else that you want to throw out there? I am on Twitter. I'm at ZSlayback on Twitter. If you're on Medium, if you're not on Medium, get on Medium. Uh, if you're on Medium, I am at The Mission. That is one of the publications on Medium. We're one of the largest publications. And I am there at Z Slayback. So same as my Twitter handle. I write quite often on there. I'll republish a lot of stuff onto my blog after I've written it on Medium, but not everything. Yeah, cool. Thanks so much for coming on. This is a lot of fun. And we I feel like we covered a lot of ground. So that was great. Now, this conversation really flowed. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, this is fun. Um, we'll definitely have to keep in touch. And you're going to be in Pittsburgh for a while, right? Yeah, I, I live in Pittsburgh. My lease is until July of next year, unless I have any strong reason to leave. Like I love Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh's a great city. It's very underrated, I find. Yes. The big difference is you have to have a car. So a lot of students hate it because they can't get off campus. Once you can get off campus and go around, it's amazing food. It's beautiful in the summer. Uh, everything is so cheap. Like It's pretty great. I love it. I'll probably be there for the foreseeable future. I was either going to move there, Austin, or Mountain View. And uh, Austin's expensive now too, man. Like It's not Manhattan expensive, but it's pretty expensive. It's gotten up there, yeah. Well, I'll have to hit you up when I come back for Carnival. Do a round two in person or something. Oh, yeah. Carnival in the spring. Yeah. No, definitely let me know. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of your trip and we'll we'll keep in touch. Yep. Thanks, Nat. Thanks, Zach. See you. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of NatChat. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe to NatChat in iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Second, if you're trying to take advantage of some of the information from this episode, be sure you check out the show notes at nataliason, N-A-T-E-L-I-A-S-O-N dot com slash podcast. And find a friend, because implementing a lot of this stuff is much easier if you have somebody to do it with. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode and you've been enjoying other episodes of the podcast, please leave it a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your casts so that more people can find it. This is the best way for it to get some more exposure and to make sure that I can keep bringing these episodes to you. With that, thank you and have an awesome rest of your day.